an 18-year-old young woman drove her car to another city and disappeared without a trace. And a week later, her body was found in a river. The police had no suspects, and her car could not be found for years. Only 14 years later did the young woman's relatives learn the gruesome truth. Lisa Kimmel was born July 18, 1969, in the small American town of Covington, Tennessee. Soon, her parents had two more daughters, and in 1972, the family moved to a town called Billings. From an early age, the girl was distinguished by her independence and determination. She helped her parents take care of their younger sisters and also worked part-time at a local restaurant. Thanks to this, she earned a new Honda CRX for herself even before she graduated from high school. The young woman also finished her license plate with the inscription, Little Miss, as she was often called by her parents and sisters, and these plates would play a significant role in the whole story. After graduating from high school in 1987, Lisa decided to continue working at the restaurant despite her parents' objections. They wanted their daughter to go to college, but the young woman planned to pursue a career in her chosen direction. They eventually agreed that Lisa would work for a year and still consider going to college. The young woman worked at a large chain restaurant, Arby's, along with her mother, who was the regional manager there. And soon after graduation, Lisa was offered a management position herself, but already in another city. She was to go to the suburbs of Denver, about 900 kilometers from home, and manage a restaurant there. For the 18-year-old young woman who had just graduated from high school, it was a serious challenge, but Lisa accepted without a shadow of a doubt. In addition, her mother frequently traveled to Denver for work, and they saw each other almost every week. Sometimes the young woman herself drove to her family's house in Billings. The restaurant where Lisa worked was in a town called Aurora. She quickly settled into her new place, rented an apartment, and was generally excited about her new life. She made new friends and a few months later started dating a guy named Ed. He often went to Aurora, but lived 800 miles away. On Friday, March 25, 1988, Lisa was getting ready with anticipation for the weekend she had big plans for. She was going to go to Billings and take her boyfriend with her to finally introduce him to her family. He lived in Cody, Wyoming, which was along her route. Lisa planned to pick him up and drive on with him from there. She left Aurora at about 4 p.m. She had about seven hours to drive to the boyfriend's house. After driving about 400 kilometers, Lisa reached Douglas, Wyoming. Apparently, she was in a big hurry because at 9 p.m. a police officer stopped her car for speeding. According to his radar readings, Lisa was going about 140 kilometers per hour. He gave her a $120 fine, which state law required her to give to the officer on the spot. Lisa didn't have that amount with her, so the police officer suggested she withdraw the money from the nearest ATM near the road. They got there, but the terminal did not support Lisa's bank card. According to the rules, the police officer had to detain the offender who was unable to pay the fine, but the man agreed to let Lisa go on the condition that she send the check to the local police department. The young woman got into her car and drove on. It was about a four-hour drive from Douglas to her boyfriend's house. Woman he never waited for her that night and toward morning, Ed fell asleep. When he woke up at about 7 a.m., Lisa was still gone. In those days, there were no cell phones, so he had no way to contact her. Instead, the guy started calling the police departments of the two states. He gave them information about Lisa and her car, wondering if anything had happened. The police accepted the information, but would not file a missing persons case. The reason for this was the fact that Lisa was 18 years old and too little time had passed since she disappeared. The guy waited a few more hours and then started calling mutual friends. None of them knew where she was missing. He also called Lisa's boss and then tried to contact her parents, but they were not at home. They came back hours later and their phone was ringing off the hook. 
Several people tried to contact them at once to see if they had heard from their daughter. At first, the parents thought Lisa had just been delayed and was still on the road. She had traveled this route many times before, and it was hard to imagine that anything could have happened to her, but time passed and she was still gone. By then, her parents had called Ed and called him over to their house. The first meeting that Lisa had planned for so long happened without her and under such unsettling circumstances. Two days passed. The young woman was still unreachable, and the police refused to start looking for her. According to the law, it was necessary to wait 72 hours before filing a missing person report. The parents decided not to sit idly by, and start searching on their own. Lisa's father hired a light aircraft pilot to fly along the road where the young woman was supposed to be. He hoped this would help locate her car, but the search was unsuccessful. The father also drove part of that route in his car, but he was unable to find any sign of Lisa. The family did not stop there. The young woman's parents contacted a private investigator they knew, who had previously worked for the police. Thanks to his connections, he was able to convince the local police department to take an early missing person report. Unfortunately, they could not find any solid leads. The police immediately determined that their patrol officer had stopped Lisa the night she disappeared, but her fate remained unknown. Only one thing was clear. The young woman had disappeared with the car somewhere between Douglas and the town of Cody. The police had searched the area along that route, but there is one significant problem. We are talking about hundreds of miles of fields, woods, and mountains. It took months of work and thousands of people to cover the entire area. For this reason, the search on the ground made little or no progress. Eight days passed. On the morning of April 2nd, a man called the police. He said he was fishing in a river near Casper, Wyoming. At one point, he noticed a human body lying face down in the water. Shortly before, the fisherman had heard on the radio the police were looking for a missing young woman, so he immediately thought it was her. Detectives arrived on the scene, took the body out of the water, and determined that the deceased was indeed Lisa. Medical experts have studied the body and came to a terrible discovery. They determined that the young woman died about six days after her disappearance. That is, Lisa died just two days before the discovery, and detectives had to figure out where she was all this time. That said, police initially thought the death occurred about five hours after she disappeared, which later led to confusion. Doctors also determined that the young woman had been abused while alive and on her body they found several stab wounds and contusions. Apparently she had been thrown into the water from a bridge while she was unconscious. Police later confirmed this version, finding blood on the bridge. Finally, medical experts extracted biological material from the young woman's body, which turned out to be a sample of male semen and apparently belonged to the killer. It was sent to a lab, but in those years, the tools to study DNA were very scarce. The local lab simply did not have the necessary resources to extract the profile of the perpetrator. Detectives concluded that the killer was most likely a local resident who lived near the river. This was evidenced by the fact that the bridge from which the young woman had been thrown was located in a remote wilderness area. It had not been used for a long time, and in order to access it, one had to turn from the main road to a country road and then drive some distance. Based on that, the police assumed that only someone who knew the area well could have chosen this bridge for a body dump. Detectives focused on finding Lisa's car. They assumed that the killer had driven it somewhere and there might be additional clues in it, but the car seemed to have fallen under the ground and they could not find it. Investigators actively shared information about the case with the public, hoping that someone had useful information. The case was also widely televised, and a lot of people did come forward. But here something strange started to happen. In all, the police received more than a hundred calls. People said they had seen a Honda CRX with Little Miss plates, as well as Lisa herself, 
Only these testimonies came from different states and even Canada. A few appeals seemed more convincing to the police. Five different witnesses claimed to have seen the very car with the license plate, Little Miss, driven by a young woman who closely resembled Lisa, except this was a few days after her disappearance on March 26th and 27th. It's hard to imagine that the young woman stayed in the Casper area for several days for whatever reason and didn't see fit to call her relatives. Moreover, she had to go to work on Monday and she would never have missed it. One witness stated that there was a man sitting in the car with Lisa, but the police were unable to confirm this information. Based on all the inquiries, the detectives compiled seven portraits of the alleged men seen near Lisa, but none of them were of any help to the investigation. The descriptions were too different to isolate any one man. The police questioned the words of all these witnesses. They conceded that the killer might have driven Lisa's car, but there was no logical explanation that she herself could have driven around the area all weekend without calling her parents from any nearby payphone. Apparently, one of the witnesses actually saw the killer drive Lisa's car to hide it, and the rest of the testimony is either erroneous or outright false. Police later determined that there were several similar car models registered in that area, and witnesses may well have seen them. During the investigation, detectives identified several suspects, but they all turned out not to have been involved in the case. Six months later, police had a new tip. Someone pinned an envelope to Lisa's grave with a note. In it, on behalf of a man, it was written that he missed Lisa and called her death his painful loss. The letter was signed by Stringfellow Hawk, a character from a popular television series at the time. At first glance, there didn't seem to be anything suspicious about the note, but all of Lisa's relatives and acquaintances denied having anything to do with the letter. The detectives therefore assumed that it might have been left by the killer. In March 1989, exactly one year after Lisa's disappearance, the case was reported on a popular television program devoted to unsolved crimes. Given that it was watched by millions of viewers across the country, the police received numerous tip-off calls. It took months and extra manpower for local detectives to verify them. Lisa's parents felt that the local police department could not handle the volume of tips and leads that came in after the program aired. For this reason, they wanted the FBI to handle their daughter's murder. But Sheriff Ron Ketchum was very negative about the idea and said he had no intention of giving the case up. In spite of that, a year later, Lisa's parents still got federal investigators involved in the case with the support of higher authorities. They became involved in the investigation and wanted to work with the sheriff, but he would not cooperate or even return their calls. Thanks to the FBI's involvement, the detectives were now able to examine a DNA sample from the victim's body at a federal lab. It was compared to Lisa's boyfriend's sample, and they did not match. He had not been considered a suspect before, but the investigators decided to be 100% sure. Next, they decided to check the patrolman who had stopped Lisa shortly before she disappeared. He had a recording of a conversation with the young woman that showed him saying goodbye to her, but detectives conceded that he might have found Lisa and attacked her later. The officer immediately agreed to provide his DNA sample, and it did not match the killer's. The next unexpected tip came after a local radio station aired a program about Lisa's murder. The police were contacted by a witness who stated that he had seen the young woman stopped in the road by Sheriff Ron Ketchum on the day she disappeared, and there were some really suspicious moments here. The sheriff himself never said he stopped Lisa that night, he also actively opposed the FBI's involvement in the case, and just like that, exactly two years after Lisa's murder, a man quit the force and tried to take his own life. He was able to be recuperated and was undergoing psychological treatment at the time. Investigators came to him with questions, but Ron pleaded not guilty and refused to provide a DNA sample. This all looked suspicious, 
and the investigators began to seriously consider him as a suspect. But a few months later, when they were ready to apply for a court order for a DNA sample, the man did provide one himself, and it did not match the killer's sample. It's not entirely clear why the sheriff was acting so strangely if he had nothing to do with Lisa's murder. His colleagues pointed out that he had always been a complicated and closed person who had been through Vietnam, so he was behaving this way even before the young woman's disappearance. At this point, the police ran out of serious leads. In 1992, they published more data on the case in the hope that they would be able to find new witnesses. According to the main version of the investigation, there could have been several perpetrators. Most likely, one man kidnapped and killed Lisa, but someone helped him get rid of the car. Investigators also believed that the young woman was kidnapped during a traffic stop at a gas station or somewhere else. They ruled out the option of Lisa picking up a hitchhiker because the young woman was very cautious. Shortly before these events, Lisa's car stalled on the road and another driver stopped to help her. The young woman did not get out of the car and only lowered her window slightly to talk to him because she understood the potential risk. The police never managed to get any new leads and the case went cold for another 10 years. It wasn't until July 2002 that a long-awaited breakthrough awaited them. The local police department reopened the investigation and the first thing they did was put the killer's DNA sample into the FBI database. It didn't yet exist in the late 80s and it took many years for it to start being used en masse across the country. When they did add a sample from Lisa's body there, investigators immediately got a match. The sample belonged to a 59-year-old man named Dale Wayne Eaton, who was in prison at the time. He had been arrested in 1997 for armed assault on a family. A young couple and their child were driving through the Wyoming wilderness when their car stalled. Dale drove by and stopped to help. He inspected the car and said there was no way to fix it on the spot so we offered the family a ride to the nearest service station, which supposedly belonged to his brother. They agreed and got into his van, and a few miles later, Dale said he was tired and needed to sleep. He asked the woman to drive, and he got into the back of the van himself. When the car moved, he pulled out his rifle and ordered the woman to pull off onto a country road. But the woman twisted the wheel so hard that Dale lost his balance and dropped his weapon. They got out of the car and the perpetrator pulled out a knife. But at that moment, the father of the family grabbed the rifle and hit Dale with the butt stock. The family then got into his van and drove to the nearest police station. Detectives drove to the scene, located Dale nearby, and arrested him. During his trial, he was found to have a number of mental disabilities, so instead of going to jail, they sent him to a closed rehabilitation facility. The idea of the authorities was that he would spend several years there, during which time he would be helped to get on with his life, learn a profession, and so on. However, he escaped from there after a few months, for which he was arrested and sent to prison for five years. The important thing here is that before he was incarcerated, a DNA sample was taken from Dale and entered into the FBI database. It is because of this that investigators in the Lisa case finally got a match. He was 43 years old at the time of Lisa's murder and lived near that area. Upon examining Dale's background, law enforcement discovered an impressive list of offenses behind him. He committed his first serious crime at the age of 16. Dale sold a woman some watermelon and offered to help carry them home. When they entered the premises, the woman examined the watermelons and saw that they were rotten. She refused to pay for them and after a brief argument, Dale stabbed her and then fled. The guy was arrested the next day and the court sent him to compulsory treatment. He was diagnosed with a number of moderate mental disorders. After receiving treatment, he kept changing jobs because he couldn't get a foothold in any job. Sometime later, he married and the couple had three children. The marriage was not happy. The couple quarreled constantly and divorced after 15 years. In 1996, he moved to a town called Moneta, just an hour away from Casper. There, his in-laws had several unfinished buildings and a bus converted to housing on the property. 
It was there that Dale settled in. There were no living conditions in that bus, except for a small bed. Once in a while, he would go to a neighbor's house to take a shower. As a result, there was an inveterate repeat offender before the investigation whose DNA was found on Lisa's body, but they wanted more evidence before they could charge him. Officers arrived at the precinct where he lived before his arrest. Several neighbors lived a short distance away, and one of them told the detectives an interesting story. According to him, around the same time Lisa disappeared, Dale dug a huge hole on his property. He said he was going to put in a septic tank, but that never happened. Investigators dug up the lot and found what they had already guessed. Lisa's car with little misplates was there. With all this in hand, the police set about gathering all the data they needed to build a win-win case against Dale, since they had more than enough time. While in prison, the man had killed his cellmate, so it would be a while before he got out. In April 2003, he was finally charged with the murder of Lisa Kimmel. The man refused to plead guilty, so the case went to trial. Because of the usual bureaucracy of the American judicial system, the trial did not begin until a year later. The prosecution summoned Dale's other cellmate to testify. According to him, the man confessed to him about Lisa's murder and told him all the details. The young woman allegedly saw him on the side of the road, stopped, and agreed to give him a ride. At one point, Dale began to molest her, but was rebuffed. Then he pulled out a gun and ordered her to his house, where he held her for several days and then killed her. But no one believed this version. Lisa's parents said she would never stop at night in the middle of nowhere to take a hitchhiker. Either Dale lied to his cellmate or he made up the story himself to reduce his sentence for testifying, so he clearly had a motive to lie. According to the investigation, that's not what happened. Most likely, Lisa stopped at a gas station, and that's where Dale attacked her. They even named a specific gas station between Casper and Dale's house. Lisa had to drive past it on her way to Cody. Dale himself often drove there to use the public restroom and sink, since he had no water on the property. Most likely, he got into her car and used a gun to force her to drive to some remote location, then brought her back to his station and held her in the bus. A few days later, he decided to get rid of her, took her to that bridge, stabbed her several times, and dumped her in the water. Experts also compared the handwriting of the note left on Lisa's grave with Dale's. They found a high similarity, but it was hard to call it evidence in court. Regardless, the DNA evidence on the body and the car on Dale's property was enough to convict him. Even the attorneys understood this, and they tried to avoid the death penalty for their client rather than a complete acquittal. They pointed to the mental abnormalities that made him unable to take full responsibility for his actions, but all was in vain. The jury found Dale guilty, and as a result, he was sentenced to death. Lisa's parents then filed a civil suit against him, which was granted by the court. Dale was seized from the land, with the buildings on it, and gave it all into the possession of the young woman's parents. Those, along with the fire department, burned all these structures to the ground on Lisa's birthday. Since the conviction, Dale's attorneys have filed numerous appeals to overturn the death penalty, which have always been rejected. But in 2010, the court did accept the appeal and set a new hearing. The appeal was accepted on the grounds that in imposing the sentence, the court failed to consider the offender's severe childhood, mental disabilities, and developmental delays. In addition, lawyers latched on to Dale's cellmate's testimony. The jury was not warned that the man had been promised a reduced sentence for this, so his testimony may well have been made up. Despite all this, there is no question of a complete reversal of the sentence. Dale is still in prison and is currently 78 years old, so the death penalty is unlikely to take place. There is one more point worth mentioning in this whole story. There have been several murders and strange disappearances of young women in the area where Dale lived, which have not yet been solved. The police have no evidence on hand, but they admit that Dale could have been the killer. His entire biography indicates that he is clearly prone to serial crimes, so Lisa Kimmel might not have been his only victim. 
Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching.